Hello everybody, welcome to our day early comic review video. I'm Jason. I'm Andy. And we're with Infinity Flux Comics in Chattanooga, Tennessee, where every Monday after the comics have arrived and we've bagged and bored them, we divide them up, we read the ones that we think most people want to hear about, the ones we're most interested in, and we do what we consider a spoiler light review show. So we're going to tell you the collectability reasons you might want the issues, you know, what, what covers are really hot, which ones have first appearances, major things in them. But we're not going to tell you so much that it'll take the fun away of reading them on your own. More than that, we're going to tell you a lot about issue number ones. Like, for instance, Vanish, Eternus. Like, what are these really about? If you read the solicitation, there just ain't much there. We're going to tell you a lot more to let you know if when you go in your store, you might want those issues. So we got a big week this week. I think when all is said and done, we'll have gone through about 28 comics. We're going to show their variants and their incentives. So buckle in. Let's get going. Yep. And after all the talk of number ones, I'm starting with a number seven. <laughs> but it's because this is one of my favorite books coming out. This is Batman Superman World's Finest, number seven. And this is the start of a new story arc, as you can see there. And who is that who's character, that character there, yeah. they're calling Boy Thunder? This is, as they say, the kind of long-lost sidekick of Superman. So, what happens to this? It begins on a doomed planet. Uh, in a place called Gotham City. It's a very, uh, you know, you want one of those setups, one of those like opening things that makes you go, what? I gotta keep reading to find out what's going on. Yes, so there is a world that has a Gotham City, and two parents put their child in a pod to send him away before the planet explodes. So you've got a little bit of Superman and a little bit of Batman. I think that's what's been great that Mark White's done. Everything they've he's done has had, like, you realize why it's a Batman and Superman book. There's there's ingredients of both. It's like a twisty cone where Batman's yeah. the vanilla and Superman's the chocolate or vice yeah. versa. Uh, and so we see on Earth that a crack is like opening up in the sky and this pod comes through. But who's there to get it? But, of course, Batman and Superman. Batman flying in his Batwing and Superman catches the pod where we discover... Um, this kid is in there. His name is uh, David Sakella, which is a very normal name for a uh, pod kid. But a lot of this issue is them just trying to figure out what is up with him. We see that he is reacting to Earth's sun in kind of the same way as Superman. Um, but the results are he's got, he can't fly, but he's got kind of like the solar burst power that they put him through a bunch of tests superman even takes him to the bottle city of candor to some of the kryptonian scientists to get him checked out but there's a lot going on in this one uh you find out that his parents were the first ones in his world to discover the multiverse and so that's kind of one of the reasons he came through it and this is really setting up a bigger story going forward of is this do we is this all as straightforward as it seems? You know, is this kid good? Is, what's up with this world he comes from? There's got to be something a little fishy going on here as well. But it's cool. This is the first appearance of a character. A pretty you know starts off with a pretty firm storyline that uh, you really feel for this kid. And there is some uh, last kind of like two pages, kind of an after the credit scene that we see what one of our new upcoming threats is going to be, which is uh, pretty creepy. So I really enjoyed this. You find out, hey, he gets that suit on the cover. And there is also uh, when Batman and Superman are out doing the grown-up things, what does Robin take a kid to go do? You'll have to read that too, because I love that part, and I can't wait to see uh, the next issue where they explore that more. So that is Batman Superman World's Finest number seven. The first appearance of Boy Thunder. Yep. Uh, definitely one of the best books on the stand, in my opinion. We also have some variants for it. We have the Middleton variant. And we have the Dan Mora variant. Yep, Dan Mora is on art again. Mark Wade writing, so you've got that, that classic team now. And there's a really funny Dan Mora joke in it. There's a YouTube video, and just read the comment in the YouTube video 
that Dan Moore does because it makes him sound really dumb and it's really funny. Okay, so I, I'm i not starting with the number one. I'm starting with the one shot, but this is okay. a really important one. I had a great time reading this. It is Harley Quinn's 30th anniversary special. So hard to believe Harley Quinn has been around for 30 years, but she has. And um, they bring all the creative teams back into this. This is a $9.99 book because it is 100 pages. And I don't feel like it was phoned in. I feel like they, they earned that $9.99. All the creative teams, you could tell they love Harley because they brought back a lot of people who've worked on her. I mean, this has – so this is just some of the people. Amanda Connor, Jimmy Palmiotti, Paul Dini, Bruce Timms, Stepan Sajic. Stephanie Phillip, Riley Rosimo, the Dodsons, and I mean, that's just some of the people yeah. who work on this. There are 10 stories in this, and I'm going to tell you the premise to a few of them, because I really enjoyed these stories. The, the first one, Alfred and Harley team up. That's a team up you've really been waiting for. You know, Harley hears some people are going to rob Bruce Manor, or I'm sorry, Wayne Manor, while Bruce is away. So she shows up and her and Alfred have to team up to take on these villains. It's great. It's a really good story. Uh, in the next story, Harley saves some kids from a sweatshop where they're being forced to make Justice League action figures. <laughs> I mean, isn't that just the right sense of humor yeah. for a Harley Quinn comic? Um, also, you get to go into some of the other sort of Harley worlds that have been created by other creators, like uh, Stepan Sajic did Harleen, which I highly recommend. Mm -hmm. The art, the story, fantastic. Well, there's a story set in Harleen, which is really cool, where um, Harley tries to understand the part of herself that used to be submissive to the Joker. You know, Harleen deals with some of the harder, like, yeah. more adult aspects of Harley, so it's pretty cool uh, seeing that. Uh, and then there's a story from the Joker Harley criminal sanity universe where um, it's before she knew the Joker back when she's helping Commissioner Gordon try to catch the Joker because Joker had killed her friend. So, you know, set back in that time, no makeup, nothing. She is Harley Quinzel, like trying to help Gordon, who doesn't want her help. But she's a brilliant person. And what do you know? She actually has a good mind for crime, uh, finding it and, of course, eventually becoming it. And then uh, there's a Gotham City siren story where Harley, Ivy, and Catwoman have all gotten an apartment together and they throw a housewarming party. Who do they invite? Who shows up? What happens when Harley invites supervillains and superheroes? Was it, is that a good idea? Um, let's see. What else? There's a story. Here's a neat one. There's one with Harley back in medieval days. Hmm. And she's sort of like a jester going on a quest. Well, actually, people call her a jester and she gets angry about that. But she goes on a quest, and it turns out the whole thing is a tale being told by her in the future. I don't mean like sci-fi future, I mean medieval future, as Queen Harleen. Hmm. So think King Conan. And that story says, will be continued. Very so, cool. Yeah, a few of these actually say will be continued in different books that are coming up. Um, so lastly, there's supposedly the last Harley story, which, you know, I don't know if it really is. Yeah. But it's sort of a Suicide Squad, um, Harley versus Amanda Connor versus Suicide Squad sort of story. It's it's a cool read. Anyway, that's just some of them. I think that's maybe like six or seven out of the ten of them. If that hadn't sold you on the book, I don't know what will. Probably these covers. Yeah, the incentive covers are really good too. So here is the Art Germ cover. And then we have, this is the uh, Bruce Tim cover. Classic. Yeah. We have the Dodson cover. I just say Dodson because, like, the whole family works on it now. <laughs> yeah, which, Terry you know, and Rachel. It's great. Yeah, and I think, like, one of their kids does stuff with them now, too. Or someone else with a Dodson name is huh. doing stuff with them now, too. Here is the Bermejo cover. I like how even some of these gave her a, a new look. They, she kind of has new costumes and stuff. Here is the Sajic variant. Here is the J. Scott Campbell variant. Like, I think that's kind of a new look for her. Yeah. And then here is the Adam Hughes variant. This one just gets better the more you look at it. <laughs> and you see, if, it's very subtle, but she's holding her nose. You know, it's like she's like... Trying to pop her ears yeah, or something she's, and her head she's, blows she's up. She's doing that. Yeah. Um, and a couple of incentives. Here's the 1 in 25 Amanda Connor variant. We're selling for 20 bucks. 
and you know you really got to see it with the you know because here's Harley she's planted the bomb and then here's what oh, happens. Oh, that's funny. Yep, when the bomb. I was off. thinking, oh, is that just like a virgin variant? No, yep. it's it's not, the moment not, after. Not at all. Yeah, so we're selling that to our customers for twenty bucks, and that, that's it. That's all the ones I have to show. That's awesome. Oh. I'm very excited about reading that one. Next up for me is a new X Men number one. This is going to be a mini series. I believe it's five issues, if I remember correctly. But this is X Terminators number one. So you can see your team on there. We've got Dazzler is kind of our main character. We've got Boom Boom. We've got Jubilee and uh, Laura Kenny Wolverine on there. Which uh, you'll have to read to find out why she's on here. But the first thing I'll say about this book is when you open the cover, there is a giant. Uh, it's like a warning. A man. warning on it. This is probably um, the most. I don't know if it's the most mature X-Men book I've read, but it is up there because it has, it warns you of everything that's in this. It's violent. There's a language, even though most of it is kind of black barred out. Um, just everything. So why is it like that? Because this is, uh, it begins with Dazzler, who has just been broken up with by her boyfriend that she's had for two months. She's thrown his stuff out the window in a very classic style. He's kind of a, I don't know, he's kind of a tool. He's got like the open shirt and he's got this big medallion and stuff. I don't know what, what kind of guys Dazzler goes for. But she's depressed and she calls up Jubilee, who is living on Krakoa. So this is in continuity, but you definitely don't have to be reading any of the other X-Men stuff to get what's going on. Um, she calls up Jubilee and says, hey, I'm, I'm depressed. I want to go out and party. Find whoever wants to go and we're going to go out uh, to my favorite bar. And so Jubilee gets a uh, boom boom. And to tell you, this is the, the sweariest they are. Even though it's blacked out, they are just swearing at each other constantly. It's like, these are some salty X-Men. Um, but they end up going out. And of course, like a lot of these um, comic versions of the, the night on the town, it definitely goes bad when we find out that her ex-boyfriend was actually a vampire. And uh, without getting into too much detail, these uh, the girls get drugged and they wake up in a crazy place with monster trucks, with swamps, with mazes. We don't know exactly what is going on, but it is full of violent action and over-the-top shenanigans. Almost feels a little Harley Quinn-esque, especially Boom Boom, the way she's dressed and everything. Very Harley, but this is a really fun book. Definitely not for kids, but if you're kind of looking for an X-Men thing that's not so weighted in continuity with what's going on with either Axe or with all the Krakoa and Araco and the, you know, the Five and the Quiet Council, if you want something outside of that that is the X-Men doing kind of a one-off X-Men adventure, you'll definitely want to pick up Exterminators number one. And I'm looking forward to seeing where this goes. Uh, this is written by Lee Williams, and the art is Carlos Gomez, and it is beautiful, really cool. Got variants for it as well. We've got the Art Adams variant for the X23. Again, you notice I did not mention her at all in this. You'll have to read it to find out why. We've got the Scotty Young. And this is actually pretty accurate to something that happens in this book, so that gives you a little bit of an idea. We also got some incentives. We have the Mueller 1 in 10 variant. They do for all their X-Men number ones. Selling this for $10. And this one, I know a lot of people really interested in. This is the 1 in 25 Inyuk Lee Dazzler variant that we are selling to our customers for $20. All right, so I read Edge of Spider-Verse number four, where they are gathering all the characters that are going to appear in the upcoming Spider-Verse crossover event that they're going to be doing. And so let's check out the cover here. We got Spider-Ham. We have um, this new character, Sun Spider, who is actually um, a disabled spider character. And then in the background, we have the Spider-Mobile. 
And yes, they are all in stories in this. Um, there are four different tales because I guess I, let me get out of the way the collectability part. So this has the first appearance of three new spider characters. Two I think are definitely significant for the, the Spider-Verse series. The, the, the last I think is more of a comical character for this. But you never know who blows up someday. Mm -hmm. So this is first appearance of Sun Spider I mentioned. The disabled spider character on the cover. Then there is Spinstress, who is sort of um, a spider character from like a Disney type fairy world, you know, sort of like a cross between Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty world. Mm -hmm. I'll get more into that in a minute. And lastly, is a character called Pete Spider Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Pete Spider Man. So he's in the first story, and it's his first appearance, but I don't know if we'll ever see him again. Mm -hmm. He felt like more comic relief. So the first story is in Spider Ham's world, where he meets Pete Spider Man, who's from another multiverse world. Pete Spider-Man is like one of the weaker, lamer forms of Spider-Man across the multiverse. He got bit by a spider from some like patio furniture. It was like <laughs> hiding in patio, patio furniture. And he has like pretty good powers. Like they're not great. You know, like he can web, he can wall crawl, but he has trouble on stucco. You know, it's stuff like that. And Spider-Ham is not impressed with them. They end up teaming up and you'll have to read how that goes. The second story is the spinstress story. And as I said, she's in like a Snow White Cinderella world where she's like singing and she's really a princess, but in disguise and she has spider powers. There's a bunch of villains that they fit into, you know, like I'll give you an example of one. There's she has a fairy gob mother. <laughs> so you'll have to read to see how they fit all that in. But she's definitely getting pulled into this event. The third story uh, maybe stands out the most to me. It's the Spider Mobile's car story. And he's in the, the car is in its own world. Okay, where everything's cars. So it's like a sentient car. Yes, it's okay. a sentient car. And in fact, they reveal the identity of the Spider Mobile is named Peter Parked Car. <laughs> so That's you such get a the, lame dad joke. <laughs> you get to see. I know, but you know, you get to see it in its own world and how its powers work. I mean, it's a car. It's, you know, how spider-like can it be? Yeah, it could drive up. A lot has to do with its headlights. I'll say okay. that. And then the last story is Sun Spider story, the disabled spider superhero character who is going to her prom. So she's more high school aged. And her prom, there's a high school aged Doc Ock who wants to improve her, her legs. He wants to give her new mechanical legs that she is not interested in. And he does not appreciate the unrequitedness of his affections so that's generally what's going on in edge of spider verse number four another one i enjoyed quite a bit the uh incentives here is the chen incentive i mean right there that's all you need to know about spinstress mm -hmm. spinstress you know right there you get the feel and then there's also a one in ten is also by chen that we're selling to our customers for 10 bucks this is sort of the design variant do we have one more issue of that? Is yeah, there, I yeah. think it's a five. Five, five issue. Okay. Yeah, and then we get into uh, all the new spider stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, so another really big one this week is Vanish, number one from Donny Cates and Ryan Stegman. So this is your Venom team coming back together for a new Image comic under Donny Cates's imprint, uh, KLC. Right? Yeah. Kids Love Chains Press, the imprint of uh, Image. So, this is definitely one I think, you know, you could look at it and be like, that looks really cool. But a lot of people have questions about what is this actually about? Is it a superhero? Is it magic? It's everything. So, this is about a man named Oliver Harrison. And he, you know, this begins with him walking down a back alley. Uh, he's just talking about all the different kind of horrible things he's done. Uh, he's addicted to everything. He's just, you know, definitely uh, had a really rough life. And he witnesses, uh, well, some there's like some muggers that try to take him on. They realize this guy doesn't even have any money. Uh, but that he gets stopped by uh, a superhero, like a kid superhero. And uh, Oliver Harrison doesn't like this, and this kind of leads into him telling his story about he is actually from a like a fantasy world, 
Like it shows a big it's castle in the clouds. There's dragons. There's magic. It's very um, a little Harry Potter feeling uh, because there is like the Academy of Magic. And one day it got attacked by this big villain and his his kind of crew of people. And Oliver broke the rules and did something uh, that you're not allowed to do. He snuck into a place you're not supposed to go. But in doing so, he found a way to defeat this enemy. Uh, but that's not before this enemy had killed like most of the people there, including his parents. So now he definitely wanted revenge. Uh, but when he, he kills the big bad guy, his backup people run away. And he's not satisfied till they're all gone. And so he's a little bit of a, to everyone, he's like a hero, but he's kind of got the child star purse. So he's older, he, he's kind of never recovered from that, and he realizes that maybe the superhero that just busted in here and saved him is one of those people, one of the followers of the big villain. He doesn't even really know it for sure, but he just has a feeling. So he's kind of got these magic powers, his magic cloak, all this stuff. So it's kind of a mix of, um, what did I get? It's a little bit of Harry Potter, uh, child star, kick ass, definitely with the, like the kind of street violence and everything. Uh, and then with Stegman's art and Donny Cates writing, I get a lot of like spawn in the darkness feel to it. Even the main character looks a lot like the darkness. So it is a really fun adventure. I think it's an oversized, uh, issue. So I feel like you actually get, a lot you you get the origin you get where this guy's coming from and at the end you kind of see on the final page here's what his mission is going to be so if you are a fan of uh definitely ryan stegman or johnny cates any of their work this is them at their best uh, if you're a fan of their Venom run you get a lot of that he feels very much like the downtrodden Eddie Brock that Donny Cates had written about, you know, the bearded kind of uh, doesn't really know how to be a father type uh, version of him. I just think this is going to be a pretty big hit uh, with a very strong first issue. Strong creative team, and it's yeah. their own independent thing now. They don't have, you know, Marvel editors yeah. on their shoulders. Yeah. Of course, you know, they've both done indie work too before this. Yeah, you can tell this is a step above just in all of the writing and all of the storytelling and the art and everything that you're you're getting some people at the top of their game. And I want to say, because I, I didn't say how, and it's in the solicitation that he beat this big bad guy, so that's not a, not a spoiler. That's kind of the setup for this. How he beats them is kind of a question that I've heard a lot of people raise in the Harry Potter world. Why don't you just do this? And uh, this character does that, and it's it's pretty remarkable that it works. So uh, really fun issue, but very dark, very violent, very brutal. But I think a lot of a lot of people who just kind of like that image comics style book, uh, image comics indie superhero, will like this one a lot. And of course, we've got some variants for this. We have the Daniel Warren Johnson variant. We've got a blank sketch variant. We've got the 1 in 10 McGinnis variant. You've got some big names on these variants. And of course, we've got the 1 in 25 Greg Capullo variant for $20 for our customers. And I don't think I said the McGinnis one is $8. Capullo is 20. I mean, that's just such a, like, Capullo was, this character was made for him to draw him. So that is a pretty big one this week. Okay, another pretty big indie book out this week is Eternus. So this is from Andy Serkis and Andrew Levitas, who, you know, of course, Andy Serkis is well known throughout Hollywood. Andrew Levitas is a screenwriter. So, I mean, this is definitely two people right out of Hollywood making a comic, which sounds very much like they're test running something that they might want to option or turn into something else. And honestly, I think this comic has a lot of collectability for, for that reason. Like those of you who are looking to grab things that could get turned into stuff, 
you might want to get this one for that reason. So as far as what it is about, you know, we have Medusa on the cover. That's a big hint. This is set in ancient Greece, but it's not as ancient as a lot of the ancient Greece stuff. This is sort of towards the fall of Greece where uh, Christianity is rising up and all the Grecian stuff is just sort of um, sort of dropping down. So at this time, there is this warrior that comes along. You'll have to read to find out who. Uh, and they kill Zeus. Not just Zeus, but another major Grecian figure as well. And this figure is basically like you get introduced to Hercules, who's kind of like a drunk who's given up on life. And it's up to Hercules and the only witness of this murder, who was a blind girl. You know, she heard the voice, she felt the face, but mm -hmm. that was it. Um, it's up to those two to try to find who this person is, to try to enact revenge. So that that's generally what this story is about. However, there's much more in this. There's a lot more characters, a lot more situations going on that if I told you all about, you'd be like, well, why? And I, my answer would be, I don't know yet. You know, it's like there's this wine dealer and he has all this money and he's giving away free wine and that is in this. Why is it happening? I don't know yet. It's like they, a lot of setup is going on in this. I think this is a sort of book if for people who like Grecian stuff, you're going to like it. I think the setting is a lot of this book. I, w I wouldn't recommend this just blanket for everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not like a, everyone can open it and you'll all love it. I think... um this is told in an indie style that you're going to have to want to roll with it. There's a lot of show without tell, a lot of, well, why should I keep reading? So I think that setting's going to have to really hold you in there. That, or if you're interested in buying things and reading them before they get optioned, done by two yeah. Hollywood people. So that's what's going on with Eternus number one. And we have this one variant. This is the Hell variant. Now, this one a lot of stores might not have because you had to order so many to be able to get any of these. Mm -hmm. But once you ordered enough, you could order as many of these as you want. So we, we have a pretty good bit for our customers. But some stores may not have ordered enough to get any at all. Okay, next up for me is our next installment of Batman One Bad Day Two-Face. So this is our second issue First one was Riddler. Now we have Two Face. And uh, it's funny because when we did our other show, I thought that this had already come out because I kind of read this one a little bit earlier. But rereading it, I realized I missed a lot in it. Um, so, of course, this kind of, in a loose sense, catalogs like a really bad day in the lives of these villains. It's not always the thing that like turned them into the villain. It can happen during just the main kind of Batman continuity or, you know, whatever. Um, and this one starts actually when uh, Harvey Dent may be getting better. He may be being able to um, control the the evil side of his, I want to say the evil side of his face, but the evil side of his personality. And so much so that Mayor Nakano... Uh, which is interesting. He's in here because he's a pretty recent character. So that kind of makes this feel like it's a pretty up-to-date book. Um, gives him his DA job back, which I feel like, I and mean, that's a pretty big thing for this criminal that, you know, has has done some pretty horrible things to give him. Here's a bunch of power and position. Yeah. I'm sure you, you'll you know, He warns that. him. He's like, one mistake and you're out of there. But he gets that. And, of course, Batman is concerned but maybe not concerned enough because if you remember, uh, he was friends with Harvey Dent before the the Two Face thing. They were both pretty upstanding people in Gotham society. They they really wanted to make the city better, and a unexpected character comes in and kind of questions Batman, and that's Stephanie Brown, who her father, which was the Clue Master, uh, had something very similar where uh, she said she doesn't like when um, villains then suddenly pretend to be good guys again, and everyone just says, oh, it's fine. So this definitely deals with a lot of the, uh, is can you trust someone who who is so two-sided, who could be hiding that other side the whole time? And this all comes to a head when 
Harvey Dent's father is about to have his 88th birthday and he gets Harvey Dent gets a note that basically says um you know this is your father's last birthday so how does this tie in with what is going on with Harvey Dent um who is the one who made these things it may, might not be who you think think so this is a really good one. This is written by uh, Mariko Tamaki. The art is by Javier Fernandez. Um, it's not quite the like groundbreaking story that the Riddler one was, but I feel like this one, definitely if you are reading current Batman comics, feels like it fits right alongside those and could be you know another issue of Detective Comics, a very solid, oversized issue of Detective Comics. Um, and the uh it kind of ends with a really interesting look at the relationship between batman and two-face so if that sounds interesting to you if you've been liking these one bad day books you'll definitely like this one very solid this is our a cover we have our jim lee cover which i think is interesting because cassandra kane is in this but Stephanie brown kind of has a bigger part to play so it's interesting he drew her here and that is it. Okay, so. I'm holding it upside <laughs> down. I read the latest issue of Nightwing, Nightwing issue number 96. Wow, we are <laughs> headed towards issue 100. So I like how they did this cover. It's sort of a, a like a Brady Bunch cover. Yeah. With all the Bat family and Haley on there. Haley's even like licking the camera. Um, so. And uh, this is the finale to the Blockbuster arc. You know, Blockbuster being sort of the main villain of Bloodhaven, the main gangster guy. And in last issue, Nightwing called in favors with the Bat family and all kinds of other friends. I mean, Flash showed up. I mean, it was like all these major superheroes show up because he wanted to once and forever take over or take down Blockbuster and his crew. Well... It worked really well, except that Blockbuster had some uh, plans in mind. He had some bombs go off. Bloodhaven is set on fire really badly. This this all happened last issue. And the main thing is, is that Blockbuster got Nightwing by himself and found out his identity. Mm. So this issue is the finale. It is Nightwing versus Blockbuster. One-on-one -on -one fight. Uh, just a brutal, brutal fight. A lot of words between the two of them. So this finally sort of seals what's going to happen with Blockbuster and, and everything. Uh, on top of that, there's a creative use of the old comic code. You know, the comics code mm -hmm. logo. They do a parody of it and they use it over some very saucy language and <laughs> gestures throughout the comic, which I think is very funny. They put the, the like this parody of the logo over stuff. Uh, lastly, there are also some very deeply romantic words between uh, Dick and Barbara, sort of a, a part of this as well. So another really good issue of Nightwing, and that wraps up that arc. We have uh, two variants here. We've got the, yes, this is the Alan Qua variant for Harley's 30th. And, of course, we have the Jamal Campbell variant. With the couple and lastly we also have the one in 25 akuna variant that we're selling to our customers for 15 dollars and next we have our installment this week of acts which i think you're going to be going over some acts tie-ins as well related to related yeah, to yeah. yeah but uh no we have acts number five yep number five this week you can see that foreboding of that celestial. So, this issue, uh, a lot of characters die. I'll say that because I feel like something's going to happen that's going to reverse that. But, I mean, this is another brutal issue. I said the last one was really dark. This one isn't quite as dark as the last one, but still, I mean, this they're going to need like an infinity gauntlet or something to turn this one around. Uh, because of course, uh, the judgment is being passed on many different characters. And some of the ones, though, can't forget that even though the uh, the five and all of their stuff was destroyed, 
there's a few of the eggs left and they can bring people back. So who are they going to bring back even if they're, you know, judged poorly and destroyed? That's a big part of this. And I think I I don't want to say I had a problem with the last issue, but uh, Captain America seemed kind of defeated um, morally, spiritually, whatever. Uh, but he actually has a really nice comeback in this where he kind of steps up and knows the right thing to do. And I really like Captain America in this issue. Um, and someone gets reborn in the end that you may not expect or didn't even think was possible. Uh, you'll have to see. I think, is this, I can't remember it because it doesn't say on the cover if this is six issues or seven issues. But uh, it definitely didn't feel like a penultimate issue, but we may only have one left for Axe Judgment Day. Then we have some variants. We have the Wernick variant, really nice one with Destiny. We have, as you said, we've got the Dodson's cover. Very nice. And we have the Podnock variant. All right, so I read Carnage, issue number six. So, of course, uh, Carnage and his acolyte are in the Norse hell, and they are racing against Detective John Shade, who has been imbued with the spirit of Cletus Cassidy. So it's kind of like <laughs> Carnage and his acolyte versus Cletus Cassidy and his. And they're in a race in this issue to try to reach Ma Malekith, there, there's a reason that Carnage wants Malekith, and thus Cletus wants Malekith first to stop what Carnage is doing. And this is all about who can get there first, what happens when one of them reaches Malekith first, and what does Carnage really want to do? What, I mean, we know his plan is something very cosmic, and, you know, he wants to sort of go null godlike. So how can this all figure in? That is generally what is going on in Carnage issue number six. And we have this Shalvi variant. I have read on at least one site, people are saying there might be some new form of Carnage in this. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I read the issue. Nah, not really. They're probably thinking of the Hellhound from the last one. So it's some uh, like misinformation. Yeah. And another number one this week. There's a lot of number ones this week. This is Stuff of Nightmares from Boom Studios and written by R.L. Stein. So this is written by R.L. Stein, but this is not a, uh, a kid's comic. You know, he's been branching out doing more adult stuff. Uh, the art is by A.J. Kaplan. And you can see there's... Full, full of horror and weirdness on this Frankavia cover. So this is in your style of um, creep show or tales from the crypt or creep show you say <laughs> or I don't know uh, Elvira whatever uh, because we have our host uh, called the Nightmare Keeper and he has what does he call it uh, I don't have it written down but basically he said he used to have a uh, uh, like a curio closet, but his weird collection got too big and now he has a whole room for it. Uh, but of course, his room is full of a bunch of different weird artifacts. And one of them he wants to point out is the hand of William H. Uh, Seward, the secretary under Abraham Lincoln, which I don't know if I 100% understand how this that one thing ties in the rest of the story, if it's more of just in the um subject matter because Lincoln's not really brought up or, or his secretary anything in this issue but it's a it's a very intriguing start to it and we've got this character this uh, nightmare keeper we don't see his face he's a very shadowy dark character uh, but of course he has a little sense of humor like it seems like all of the the hosts do but he tells a story about um a man who begins with a man who's making a delivery to a place he goes missing. Then we pick up with a journalist who's trying to, uh, one, she's kind of boned because places aren't doing newspapers anymore, and that's what she always wanted to do is write for a newspaper. Uh, and she was writing on this missing person, which leads her and her boyfriend into a uh, very Frankenstein-esque 
uh, adventure that is full of monsters and a bunch of weirdness and mad scientists and all of that fun stuff. Um, and these creepy little monsters you can see on the cover. But it's a fun issue if you like those anthology style Crypt Keeper stories. I'm sure you'll be saying a lot of the similar things for Creep Show, but, uh, but written by R.L. Stein. Now, this is wordy. I mean, this could have also been a novella because of, you know, you get a lot of that R.L. Stein dialogue and um, the funny little stuff that he, he's known for in this. So, but if you're a fan, definitely want to check this one out. If you're a fan as a kid, now you're grown up and you still want a little bit of that R.L. Stein feel, this one will be good for you. Of course, it's got a lot of variants, which I think is really cool. Um, we've got this one. This is the uh, Mercado, which is loosely based off of his, uh, the, how his novel covers look. For sure. Yep. The, I forgot what, Fear Street or whatever that, that series was called. Then we have this, which I love this. Um, this is the Jacobus variant, which was your cover artist on all the Goosebumps books. Uh, he's a very interesting person if you... Uh, do some research on it. I've been at cons with him. Just incredible artist. I'm glad to see he's back doing work. We also have the Virgin version of the Francovia cover, but still open order. And then we have this very creepy Kyle Hotz variant. Then we've got some incentives. We've got this 1 in 25 Gorum variant that we're selling to our customers for $20. Those are your, your journalist and her boyfriend, I believe. Or that might be some of your... No, those are your mad scientists. And we also have a one per store Francovia variant for $20. Well, I'm glad Halloween is about you know, five weeks, a little more, five <laughs> weeks away, because otherwise I would say it's real unfortunate they're releasing two very cool sounding books that just are similar mm -hmm. with stuff of nightmares and creep show. But I think this is a situation where uh, since the season is right around the corner, it might be an all ships rise. Somebody comes in for one and they end up picking up yeah. both, which could really uh, help both creative teams get, get some, get to their audience. So I read creep show number one, this, of course, is linked in with the, the um, hit show on Shudder, which is helmed by Greg Nicotero, who, of course, is from Walking Dead fame. And uh, this is the first Creepshow comic in some time. It does have the Creepshow, Crypt Keeper, Creep Guy, who narrates a little bit. There are only two stories in this anthology, though, hmm. which I'm fine with that because it's not like it's a shorter book. It just lets each story breathe a little yeah. bit more. The first story is by Chris Burnham, and it's called Take One. And it's about kids who go up to a house where it has the full candy bars mm -hmm. with the bowl, and it says, please only take one. And the little, little kids grab a whole handful. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And this, this house over. also has a reputation for being a haunted place, and they don't care. They're very disrespectful. And let's just say it ends up very bad for them, <laughs> you know, which what I like about it, it's a very Halloween story, yeah. you know, everyone's wearing costumes and I mean, they're literally trick or treating and getting chased down because of what they did. There's uh, lots of candy eating, some to hide the evidence. Uh, there, there's candy coming back up, <laughs> get rid of the evidence, you know. Uh, the, the, uh, the other story is by Paul Dini, Stephen Langford with art by John McCree. And it's called Shingo. Now, that's not a word you should have heard because it's a name. Okay. It's called Shingo. And Shingo is basically this thing that the mom hires for a kid's party. It's a kid's birthday party, last minute. She can't find a clown. Oh, well, here's a Shingo person. It's not a clown, though. In fact, you'll see it on one of the variant covers, one of the incentives. It looks a little bit like it would be from Twig's World. Like, I'm talking the Twig comic. Wait till you see. This thing, it looks more like a, a goofy creature. And so the kids are like, are you from a show? Like, what are you <laughs> from? Like, you're clearly something. Yeah. Well, of course, this thing is evil, and it eats kids. And so there's a lot of, you know, the kids finding this out a little too late. 
But that's not all there is to it. The story does have a twist, and maybe the kids will flip things on Shingo. So that's the two stories you're in for if you read the Creepshow comic. The art's really good, cool, you know, definitely appropriate art for this sort of thing. Here are the variants. This is the Shalvi variant. And then there is a blank variant where you can have your favorite artist do what you want on there. And lastly, here is the 1 in 10 variant, the Kelly variant. So here is the shadow of the Shingo creature. This thing is actually very colorful, sort of like blues and such. But I mean, can't you just see that in Twig's world? That's what I asked you when it was just sitting there. I was like, oh, that looks like a Twig cover before you even told me anything about it. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I feel like we're we're just getting the just the beginning of all these Halloween books coming out. I have a lot off to a pretty strong start. Yeah, R.L. Stein and a creep show comic. That's that's awesome. Name name brand horror. So next up, I have Titans United. Blood Pact. I can want to say Bloodstone because there is a Bloodstone in it, but it's Titans United Blood. So this is. Um, this is interesting. There was a Titans United book before. This is written by Kevin Scott. And it's not in the universe of the HBO Titans show. But as you can see on the cover down there in the corner, it does kind of be like, watch Titans now on HBO. This is a um, its own world, but your classic team of Titans doing Titans adventures. So I feel like it's it's without being... Connected to the Titans show, it's still that. Um, it's still accessible for people who've maybe never read a Teen Titans book, but like those characters. So in this, you've got your classic Titans team. You can see a lot of them on the cover. You've got Nightwing, but you also have uh, Tim Drake Robbins, Starfire, Raven. Um, who else you have? Donna Troy, Beast Boy. All, all the greatest hits are there. And in this one, we actually pick up right in the middle of a fight because um, the Fearsome Five, you'll have to look them up if you see if you've ever heard of the Fearsome Five, have stolen the Bloodstone from the Gotham Museum. We don't really know why, but of course there's a lot of witty banter as the Titans take on uh, the Fearsome Five. Um, but of course, if you're dealing with the Teen Titans and something has the word blood in it, you know, Brother Blood, one of their big villains, is not too far behind. And uh, he casts some kind of spell, I won't give it away, but uh, that turns one of the Titans maybe into a uh, almost a deity in another universe. So pretty interesting. If you're just looking for a fun one-off story that's not tied to any main continuity it's just kind of a uh, a mini series that's all its own standalone with characters you love that is titans united blood pact the art is really good too it is very classic um dc superhero really cool we also have this uh chew variant with raven i always think it's interesting when Bra raven has the white suit we also have this uh, Hispanic Heritage Month variant. This is by uh, Molina with Kyle Rayner on there. And we have a 1 in 25 Clark variant. We're selling to our customers for $15. Okay, I read Flash issue number 786. This is a Dark Crisis tie-in. And it truly is a tie-in because you have the West family and the rest of the speedsters, they're running a bunch of heroes, like the heroes that are left over on Earth because, you know, of course, Justice League being gone. They're running them around to places to stop Deathstroke's army. Deathstroke's army is popping up all over the place. They don't know where, so they divide up and the speedsters get everywhere where they're going. Um, but that's just a little bit of what happens in this. A few other noteworthy things. So Linda, Wally's wife, gets her outfit in this. Oh. Yep. She gets her speedster outfit in this. So the whole West family are now speedsters. <laughs> and, of course, the kids want to help. You know, Linda doesn't want them to, but you know how that's going to go. Does she get a name? Um, You know, no. She does not get her name yet. 
Man, costume before a name. That's, yeah, um, Wally's son, he really solidifies his name in this, which is great because also he gets taught a few extra powers from Power Girl. Power Girl's like, oh, you want to learn some things? And she teaches him some things he can do with his power that he just goes, he starts spamming, you know, right <laughs> away. So that, that part's really good. And on top of that, the West end up fighting a horde of Nazi zombies that are led by a magic-wielding evil boy that hasn't been seen in comics in a while, who reminds Wally that there are some very dark things that he knows is going to come to pass someday. And Wally's just like, no, 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 not in front of my family. I don't want to talk <laughs> about it. So you have to read to see who this boy is. But this is a pretty powerful character who also can sort of look into the future you know it's magic yeah uh lastly there's the promise at the end of the issue that next issue wally is going to become a professional wrestler can't wait so yeah i feel like that's you know the the writer's like okay yeah dark tyson dark crisis it was cool to do this tie-in but you know i'm getting back to <laughs> my own stuff after yeah. this so and as far as variants here is the Kem kembadias variant for flash number 786 and for me, I've got Star Wars Mandalorian, issue three. So, I mean, giving you the description of it, if you watch the show, this is episode three. This is when uh, Mando takes Grogu, still known as, uh, as the child at this point. Uh, he, you know, he's been pretty conflicted, but he decides to finally take him back, collect his Beskar reward, go get himself some new armor. But then, of course, he starts to regret it and is going to try and steal the child back and make a run for it. So, like anything, if you've enjoyed The Mandalorian, you're going to love this one. A lot of fun to actually read this and, and remember the show uh, if, you're, you know, if you haven't watched it a thousand times like me. But it's still great to get this in this form. Really fun issue. We also have the... Concept art variant. And we have the George's variant. And we have this super cool, I wish this was a uh, open order one, but of course, this is a 1 in 50 Ryan Stegman variant for $60. But really, really cool. Okay, so I read Berserker number 10. So only two more issues and the series is over. So this is far enough in. I don't have tons to say. Like you had to have been reading it. And also <laughs> the story is just wild. It's, you know, it's a little difficult to follow in ways. It is sci-fi. It is history. It is like Mesopotamia. It is psychology. It's it's so much stuff. So in this issue, the most I'll say is is that B, our main character, and his doctor, Doctor Caldwell, um, after putting B physically through the ringer in the last two issues, they go back to where the place on the planet where his mother was killed, so that B can deal with an emotional fallout that's supposed to be just as bad as the physical one he went through, and this might possibly cure him of his immortality and his urge to kill. But of course, the military wants something for this. Mm -hmm. So that's generally what's going on in Berserker issue number 10. And here come the slew of variants. We have the, let's see where we at. So the, the foil variant of the main cover. And there's lots of like little people all in his face. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see that when I hold the other. Yeah. Um, then we have Kevin Eastman did a variant. Oh, nice. Yep, that Eastman style, that just gritty Ninja Turtles style. There's a foil version of that as well. Same, just foil like they've done with the other nine issues. Then here is the 1 in 10 Olivetti variant that we're selling to our customers for $10. There is the 1 in 75 Virgin version of that cover that we're selling to our customers for $75. Bucks. He kind of looks like uh, he'd fit in with... Um, like the road warrior or <laughs> yeah like mad max sort of i get a little mad max vibe there then there is the virgin 1 in 50 kevin eastman variant that we're selling to our customers for 50 bucks and lastly there is a black and white 1 in 100 virgin eastman variant ours came in damaged though 
Ours is kind of damaged, so we're only selling it for 60 bucks. I, I think it's worth more than that, undamaged, but that's how it arrived. That's how the cookie crumbles or the, the comic crinkles. Yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> okay, so we finally got our issue two of Bloodborne, The Lady of the Lanterns. And this is it's really fun. Um, this is, of course, written by Cullen Bunn. And this is um, a... I, I didn't realize that after the first issue, but this is going to be kind of an anthology-style Bloodborne book, which I think actually really works for this. Um, because the the world is the interesting thing in Bloodborne, not necessarily one character. So we're following different characters in each issue. And this one follows a priest. So if you know anything about the Bloodborne universe, it's a very um, Victorian era, religious, but very dark, scary. And this priest is really trying to uh, get the congregation uh, and the town to calm down, even though he knows they're all doomed from all these monsters that have come into it. And he goes through, um, he falls asleep, he, he has a vision, and then when he wakes up, he's surrounded by monsters. And even worse for him, there may be some uh, hunters, some monster hunters in his church that he is not too happy about. It's a great issue, another just really fun um addition to the lore of Bloodborne for a a series who knows if we'll get the sequel game at some point but until then we're still fleshing out the world Bloodborne we've got some great variants for it as well this is the uh Stokely variant we've got the uh this is the Ratchmed variant, very cool. That uh, that tentacle or the the big mushroom headed thing in the background, very creepy in this issue. You get a better look at them on this cover because this is the Kowalski, that's your interior artist variant. Normal normal body, giant jellyfish head. Too many eyes and tentacle hair. <laughs> Okay, so I read Strange, issue number six. And, I mean, you can see on the cover they're trying to do sort of a classic movie style sort of thing. I don't think this is a direct homage. I looked up, I thought The Big Sleep. You know, that's what I went with because it's called The Big Spell, but I didn't see a poster just like this. But they still did a good job. Um, so this is very much a Wong issue. In fact, Clea doesn't appear in this issue, but it does not suffer because of that. This is a really good issue. So in this, Wong is trying to figure out why he has never heard of the blasphemy cartel, you know, and they have actually turned into quite a formidable force. It seems like he may have a gap in his memory about them. So he uh, goes to the bar with no doors to try to figure things out. And he also goes to a few other places and people. You'll have Black Widow in this. You'll have Jean Grey in this, which, you know, when it comes to memory, that kind of yeah. makes sense. And I'll tell you, by the end, he does unearth some missing memories, which will explain more about exactly what the um, the cartel is, which it's it's a lot worse than I expected. So just a really good Wong-centric issue. You get some more of his past. A lot of it's how he thinks, how he thinks about things. Some funny interactions, um, you know, with, with the ghost dog. It's, you know, it's, it is a really good issue. I quite enjoyed reading it. You know, it's nice that um strange is, is a strong enough series that they could go away from clea for a minute and you don't really miss her mm -hmm. you know she's still real important she gets talked about mentioned she hovers over the issue but you know was just good enough without her here is the forna's variant of course this is another one written by jed mckay and, yeah you know i always talk about much i like his stuff and here is the romero the romero variant the voices variant I've got our next issue of Deceased, War of the Undead Gods. And you can see on the cover, we've got Sinestro in this one. And this is a pretty Sinestro-heavy issue because uh, Korrigar, his home planet, is getting uh, taken over by the anti-life equation. And, of course, Sinestro, even though he's 
he's he's not a good guy. He still has a lot of love for his home planet and his people. So he gets all of his yellow lanterns together to go there. But the problem is, he's going there fully armed, all armored up with all of his yellow lanterns. And the green lanterns see this and go, he must be coming for an attack. And he's not. He's coming to defend it. But first, Sinestro has to deal with the green lanterns. And then, what do you know it? Zombie Supergirl shows up. And something even worse could be with her. Um, the ending of this really surprised me. I mean, this is definitely a world where they can do anything. They can, uh, uh, we'll just say, rings can go to anyone. And you'll have to see that in this one in a very cool way. Uh, so, Deceased War of the Undead Gods, number two. We also have this really nice Dan Mora variant. Still homaging the X-Men number one Jim Lee cover. We have the Kale New Acetate cover. I guess they're going to be doing this for all of them. And we have a 1 in 25 Stoko variant we're selling to our customers for $20. All right, so I read Black Adam issue number four. So in the previous issues, Malik saved the life of Black Adam. This issue, we get to see more of what happened when Black Adam was sort of in the land of the dead slash land of the gods, where he met that new pantheon of gods who claimed that he created them. So you get to see more on how did that happen? How did he create a pantheon of gods? Meanwhile, you get more on Malik because he gets visited by a, shall I, shall I say, demonic DC character. And after this visit, he's sort of forced to use his powers. So it's Malik out on his own using his powers for the first time without you know anybody inhibiting him. And let's just say he has a good time. I mean, what would you do if you could fly and you know were super strong and semi-indestructible? You'd probably have some fun, you know, as long as nothing was pressing on you at the moment. Um, but... The last thing I'll propose is if Black Adam is now sharing his power between himself and Malik the way that, you know, the Shazam family does, what else are they sharing? Could they be also sharing some sort of curse? So it was a little bit of a cliffhanger at the end of this about that. So here is the variant. This is the Sandoval variant. Oh, well, well I, guess, there we go. I guess that might say the last thing I didn't say. Here's as far as who else is in this. It's the Sandoval variant for Black Adam number four. <laughs> I forgot that was like It'd be great literally if it turned right out to there. be like Trigun or something. And it's like, oh, it's just a different demon on the cover. Okay. That makes me even more excited to read it because I love that character. Okay, next up I've got Star Wars Darth Vader number 27. Not a whole lot to say about this issue. This does wrap up. I don't want to say it wraps up the current story arc because... Um, uh, it, it more ends the current conflict, but it does leave us, uh, we know what's coming next, and that is Sabe is going to meet the Emperor face-to-face, -face. and will he recognize her? Will he know about her? We'll have to see, but this was another great issue of Star Wars Darth Vader, and it also has some really great variant covers. We have the Kamen Coley variant. With all those branches making a Darth Vader in the background. If they turn around, they'll notice that. Unbelievable that those trees grew just like just that. like that. There's multiple oh. universes, <laughs> multiple planets. It's bound to happen somewhere. I mean, it's true. Infinite <laughs> infinite worlds mean that's going to happen. And this one uh, is a variant I'm very excited about. So this is the Sprouse Choose Your Destiny variant. But this one has Darth Bane on it. Darth Bane is a character from, uh, began in the Expanded Universe, uh, which are now Legends. He was the, the Sith Lord that created the Rule of Two, why there is a Master and an Apprentice, that one's got to kill the other one to gain its power. And the thing about this is, he has not been in the Disney era of um, Star Wars, other than a like Force Ghost in an episode of Rebels or uh, Clone Wars. So this is the first like tangible look we're getting of him. A uh, little bit different design. 
but this could kind of be his new uh, first cover appearance for a character that is so big from the expanded universe that we're definitely going to be seeing him in something because he is very important to the history of the Sith. Okay, so I read Avengers number 60. This is an axe tie-in issue. And I'll tell you, it basically follows Hawkeye. So Hawkeye is judged by the progenitor, that is the celestial god that is judging everyone. You know, everyone has 24 hours, the world has 24 hours unless, you know, people can be judged well. Well, it judges him in the form of Black Widow because it takes on forms that, um, you know, people can more accept and be more at ease with. Well, it's funny, so this whole issue follows Hawkeye because after he discusses it with the progenitor, the progenitor basically says, your task is to prove you bring more joy and life into this world than, say, this uh, metal mailbox over here. You know, one of those big blue metal mailboxes. And um, that's what he does. Like, no joke. It really is Hawkeye trying to prove he brings more overall good and joy into the world than a metal mailbox. So, that's tough because that, that's very it, joyful. It, uh, sounds like a comedy, but there isn't as much comedy to it as you think, <laughs> really. Um, so that's what's going on. Avenger 60, an axe tie-in. And then check out this variant. This is the Durr Beyond variant. I like the video it's game. Like a, it's like a video game or like a, yep. almost like a beat-em-up or something. Choose your hero. Yeah, I think it's a one one versus one sort of video yeah. game variant. I don't know, those, all those kind of covers hit the nostalgia button in me where it's like, oh yeah, that would be a great game. It makes me start to be yeah, thinking about other characters in the game, what their moves would be. Yeah. Okay, so next up I have Star Wars Hyperspace Stories number two. So this is our second issue from Dark Horse, having the Star Wars license back, uh, the All Age um, Adventure series you can see on there that this one is about Luke and Leia. So in this, Luke and Leia are on a mission to try and find a um, a planet to set up a rebel outpost. Uh, they find a planet called uh, Bana, which is kind of a frozen planet, very Hoth-like. Uh, Leia even mentions, like, I never want to come back to a planet like this, and we all know where that ends up. But of course they run into trouble with snowtroopers, uh, the local creatures and uh, find a mining operation that may help out the rebellion. It's just a fun one and done story uh, using these characters. They're going to be, of course, bouncing out around different time frames. So really fun. We've got a variant for this. This is the Carrie Nord variant, who's going to be doing uh, the variants for the whole series. But I also, because I have to plug it every time, this one does have an ad in it at the very end for issue number three right here. And there's my name right there because I'm the artist on this issue. So definitely, if this isn't on your pull list, get it because the next one is going to be great. It says it comes out November 9th, which I hope that date stays. They haven't told me yet if that's going to be the actual date. We'll see. Comments get pushed around all the time, but very excited about that. You got to support your friendly neighborhood artist here. Andy yes. Dugan. Absolutely. Okay, so I read Fantastic Four issue 47. This is also an axe tie-in. So this happens in the 24 hours where the progenitor is judging everyone. But rather than this be about him judging the Fantastic Four, this issue is actually about an unknown enemy using the pole axe thing as a smokescreen to get into the Baxter building take it over and attack the Fantastic Four to go after a very powerful item they have. Um, a lot of the Fantastic Four are not around during this. So really it's mostly Invisible Woman having to hold off this uh, enemy who I haven't seen. I mean, might have been in something lately, but I don't think I've seen this enemy since they took on America Chavez mm. in America's previous series. Not even the main USA one, the one before <laughs> that. So I haven't seen this enemy in a while. You'll have to read it to find out who. Um, but of course, even though Sue Storm is in trouble, she is never without a plan. So this is beginning an arc that even though it's tied in with Axe, it's going to continue into its own thing. So that's what's going on in Fantastic Four, issue number 47. 
Here are the variants. So I had to take this one out of the bag and board so you can really one. see it. This is the John Tyler Christopher variant. And so, you know, he does the action figures, and this is a play set. And yeah, just, you know, in the bag of board just doesn't do it justice. I'm, I'm not going to open it all the way where you can see it together, though, because... You can just see all the I fun, like, that, gimmicks but... it would have, you know, like a slime pouring action, and the other side has a crane, and... Uh, a place so... where Spider-Man can actually swing. Yep. So... And uh, there's also, if that's not a, a variant you want, here's the Dodderman variant with all the different Invisible Woman outfits and looks for Sue Storm. Even the ones Marvel wants you to forget. These are these are always so popular. It's yeah. such a great idea to let him do this. I'd be interested now to see all of them. Like, how many has he done? Because it's been a, quite a bit. Yeah, I'd they say They used to be incentives, and now they're... We're nearing probably at least 10 of all yeah. that, has been, that have been done. Okay, next up I have Dark Crisis Young Justice, and it says versus everyone. Uh, so kind of the case in this one. It's a really fun issue where the uh, Young Justice or, you know, the three that are uh, in this other world, Impulse, uh, Superboy, uh, Connor Kent, Superboy, and Tim Drake, are going up against the whole 90s and early 2000s JLA team. So hook-handed Aquaman, uh, Connor Hawk, uh, Green Arrow, all of those, because that's kind of what this book is about, uh, that they're in this world of kind of their prime, which was their, their previous run. But we do find out in this, which I think is really interesting, because we thought, or we kind of, you know, Dark Crisis has put people in different worlds but why hasn't it referenced these, this world, in all the other books in the main series? Because maybe this one's a little bit different. And we find out who is the big villain behind this. Uh, I won't give it away, but it is a... I, unless someone can point it out somewhere else, I believe a first appearance of a new character, which is actually the child of a character I wouldn't necessarily say is a villain. But someone, uh, I was trying to think of a word, is a big hindrance in the DC universe. So you'll have to check that out. But yeah, I, I think the way they speak of him and everything is saying this is the first appearance of this character. So keep that in mind. And uh, there is a variant for it, but we do not have it. We okay, so somebody. I did read this, but real quick, I just wanted to show this is the Sozo Meka variant for Catwoman 47. The Sozo Mako variants have been very popular. They went from incentives to open order mm -hmm. because they were so popular. So I just wanted to show everyone this is out this week for those of you collecting this. Um, I, I flipped through it. You know, it, I, I didn't see anything that, you know, I wanted to see if there was any like, you know, major mm -hmm. thing in it. I'm sure it's a good read, but I, I, I didn't see anything other than just wanted to show off that variant there. And I wanted to show off that this came out. This is our second print of Frank Miller. Uh, Frank Miller presents Ashcan Edition. It's only a dollar. And everybody's scrambling for the first printing of this. Because uh, this is, of course, what we're going to be getting with the new Frank Miller line of comics. So this has uh, uh, previews for Ronin Book 2, uh, a book called Pandora, a book called Ancient Enemies, plus ads for Sin City, Meeting of the Maestros, and Sin City, 1858. So if you miss out on that first one, they did do this reprint, which I think is great that they did, because this is supposed to get people excited about all of this, and it's it's bad if your store didn't get enough uh, of the first one. So just a dollar. I think it's worth checking out, because uh, I think one of them, Ancient Enemies, has a pretty, uh, quite a few page um, story in it. So you kind of get a, a full book in this one. For yeah. And people were clamoring for the Ashkins before because only a few were sent to us retailers. We couldn't order as many as we wanted. Mm -hmm. So that's why they did the second print. Yeah. This, this way we could order as many as we want so that everyone yeah. could, could get it. Okay, so lastly, Action Comics number one facsimile is out this week as of Tuesday. So this comic first came out in 1938. So that is 84 years ago. April, 84 years ago, this comic came out. Give it another 16 years. It's going to be a 100-year-old issue. You get to see the comic. 
that started the whole superhero business. First Superman, it's going to have all the ads and everything, like that first Action Comics ad. Oh. You know, um, how many times have you seen this, but have you actually read it? Wouldn't you like one in your collection, even if, you know, it's just a facsimile? So just wanted to let you know that uh, that is out this week as well. We're going to get a lot of people and for comic book stores all across the nation with people running in saying, I got <laughs> I got Superman's first appearance and we're going to have to disappoint them all. It came in the original plastic. Did you know your store was this was this old in Fanny Flux? Wow. It was up in someone's attic. That is it. That is our uh, show for this week. I think we went over 28 comics and all their variants. So if you watched the entire thing, thank you for staying with us. A lot of work gets put into this. We like to do a good show. We like to be thorough. I try to know as much as we we can um, and know what we're talking about yeah. to some degree. So um, if you're watching on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. We appreciate that. And um, if you miss Megan, she'll be with us on Friday for Comics from the Future, but she'll also be on Whatnot tonight, 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, with her typical comic sales. So until this Friday, we will see you next time.